Yeah. We're looking again at this uh, subject of, or this verse rather, in John chapter 11, uh, verse 25. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, believeth thou this. And the last time I spoke, I started off by looking at this statement, I am the resurrection and the life. And I just spoke on the first part of it, I am. I'm still not finished on that, so I'll look at to try and get that finished tonight. You know, we look at, we read the through the word of God, but do we actually, you see, do we, do we really study the word of God? Do we really look at it in depth to see what the word, you know, that, you know what this is? This really, this, I know this convicts sinners of their sins. I know it does. But generally speaking, this word is for the people of God. It's a supernatural word. That's why the world can read it. They can read it. They can maybe be in a hotel, open up a Gideon's Bible, read it. Nice wee stories. Nice little thoughts on it. Maybe some Psalms or some Proverbs. Nice little sayings. But it doesn't always touch people's hearts because it's a supernatural book. And for the Word of God to be opened up, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to hear the Word of God. And we need the Holy Spirit to take His Word and to minister it to our hearts. That's why it's good coming to the house of God, but we need to ask the Holy Spirit to open up our hearts and see what the Holy Spirit's saying. Because there's such a depth to the Word of God. I mentioned before, when Jesus came and said, I am, I am the resurrection, mentioned it to you. Jesus' deity is laid right before us. I am, I am the I am. You know, it's not always evident right away when you're not familiar with these things. Jesus is declaring, I am. Exodus 3 and 13, as men mentioned before, the name of God was declared to Moses in the Old Testament. Exodus 3 and 14, and I mentioned this to you the last time. Why does he come and say he is the I am? Moses said to him, when, he, when, when God spoke to him and said, I'm going to use you to deliver my people from Egypt. This is in Exodus chapter 3. And it says in verse 1, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in the flame of a fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. He, he, was, what, he was looking at something supernatural. Notice it was out of something supernatural came the voice of God. And it's the same with the word of God. God's voice comes out of his word. It has to be supernatural. You see, tell me something. How many times have you came to the house of God, heard the word of God, heard the doctrines of the word of God, but been unaffected by them? You know, and heard, heard, the, heard the beautiful things from the word of God. But you see, the, the letter will never change your life. The doctrine of it will never change your life. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the supernatural power within you as a Christian that will take that truth and minister it to you and work it out in your life. That's the way, that's the, way the Christian life, it has to be supernatural. Do you realize a Christian, you're a supernatural person? You're a supernatural individual. God has made you a supernatural individual through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And for you to understand God's word, it's a supernatural word. You see, that's, what, that's why we talk about people being born again. And then, sure, in, you know, in the New Testament, when Nicodemus came, says, how can we be born again? Do we come out, come out of our mother's womb again? And Jesus says, no, it's not that. It's a spiritual birth. It's a supernatural birth. It's not natural. It's supernatural. Tell me something. <coughs> Did you come here tonight just to hear a word from Robert? Robert Stewart, Robert Stewart's preaching, that's what it said on the board. Or did you hear, came, come to hear a supernatural word from God? 
You see, that's, that's, what makes, that's what makes the Christian life totally different. We have to hear supernatural words from the Word of God, not just nice doctrine, nice thoughts. God's, God's Word is beautiful, yes, but it only becomes a reality through the power of the Holy Ghost in our life. And Moses, yes, when God said to Moses, I'm going to take you and use you as my spokesperson, Moses says, are you? I can't even talk. You know, I can't, you can't use me because I can't speak. I'm not a very good speaker. God says, come on, come on. Do you realize who's talking to you? It's me that created the mouth. It's me that created the tongue. It's me. Come on, Moses, start to realize who I am. You know, sometimes we've got, we've got to realize afresh who God is. God is able to take us, even in our inabilities at times, and show us it's nothing to do with us. It's God's power working in us and through us. That's what Christianity is. The Christian life is not me trying to live a life that's pleasing to God, no. It's me allowing the Holy Spirit through the Word of God, ministering to feeding my spirit, and for me to then live out that life that God wants for me in my Christian life. It's a supernatural thing. It must be supernatural. Otherwise, that everybody, everybody in the world would be able to receive it. And we know that's not true. Because Jesus said, no one can come unto me except the Father draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It must be a supernatural. It must be supernatural. Brother. And this had to be supernatural. How was Moses going to deliver the people of God, Israel, from the hand of Pharaoh? It had to be a supernatural hand. It's got to be supernatural. It can't just be, yes. We, we love the word of God. We love his truth. We love all these things. But it has to be more. Yes, it's the word of God and the power of the Holy Ghost. It must be supernatural, brothers and sisters. When we see this, when Jesus came, he said, I am. I am the I am. And it was God who came. God who came in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, when Moses said, I've mentioned this to you, when Moses said, now, who will I say has sent me? This is going to happen. Obviously, I need to come in some name that carries authority. I mean, I'm going, I'm going to Pharaoh. It's the same with us. When we meet difficulties in our life, in our situations, you know, the situation will say to you, aye, what are you going to do with this? You know, you know there's, a, there's, a, there's something in your life that's stopping you, that you feel it's stopping you from being the, the Christian or stopping you in your life or your service for God, and it presents itself constantly, saying, ah, I know your weaknesses. I know your inabilities. I know your besetting sins. I know this. I know that. I know that. That's the voice of the devil. We're presented with these things as Christians. But what, what do we say? Oh, no, I come to you in the name that carries authority. I come to you in the name that carries authority, in the name of Jesus. And that's how God wants us to live our life. When we come up and problems and difficulties come into our life, we've got to face those problems. Running away from them never solves them. We have to face those problems, but God gives us the ability to use his name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we come up against difficulties and problems, and God says, here, tell him my name. I am has sent you. But Moses at that moment didn't realize the authority and power that God was sending him with. But he would. It was, it would it, he would realize that what God said was going to happen. And what God was telling him to do was going to come to pass if he only believed him. And we've got to believe God. When God tells us, challenges about our life, says, look, I want to use you in a certain way. I want to be worked out. I want, you, I want my Christ to be seen in you. I want Christ to be lived out in your life. And there's certain things you say, well, I keep falling down in this. I keep, I've got a problem with that, or I've got a weakness here, or whatever it might be. God says, well, use the name. Use the name that carries authority, that carries power. And that's the name of Jesus. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. He came to take that name. Why? Because we were dead in trespasses and sins, that's why. You know, I'm alive tonight because I, I profess faith in that name. And because I profess faith in that name, through the power of the Holy Spirit gave me the ability to believe 
that that name could deliver me from my situation of sin and bondage to, bondage to sin, bondage to this world, bondage to the flesh. And that day that happened, when I put my trust in that name, the Lord Jesus Christ, hallelujah, that power came forth. And that power was manifested and became a reality in my life. And the same for you. Same for you as Christians. When we, when we, when we realize the power that's in the name of Jesus and the whole purpose as was to why the Lord Jesus Christ came. And we see from Moses' life, he would see, he would realize that, wow, this was the name that God gave him that he would use to overcome Pharaoh, overcome ultimately those who were keeping God's people in bondage. And it's the same today. Jesus Christ comes into situations in people's life. Tonight, we might have people here who don't know the Lord, who don't have an assurance of salvation, who don't know the power that's in the name of the Lord. They're looking for something. They're searching for something. There's something they know. There's just some... You ever, you ever been in a situation like that? You ever been in a situation in your life? Even as a Christian, you know you're looking for something. You know there's something. You just feel this emptiness at times, this... oh, And all of a sudden, a word comes forth. A word from God comes forth. And you know that's the answer. God's just given me the answer through the word of God. And that word feeds your soul. That word is implanted power into your spirit. And God's spoken to you through the word. And God says, go forth in my name and overcome that problem. Go forth in my name and, and be victorious in that. You know, I've mentioned scriptures of you uh, a, a number of times. Uh, from jo 1 John chapter 5. And I, I do love these scriptures because it tells us that God, I'll just read this for you, John, 1 John chapter 5, and it's, it says here from chapter, chapter 5, verses 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, his commandments are not grievous. How do you know there's been a work of grace done in your life? You know something? You love the word of God. You love God's commandments. What does God command us to love? God commands us to love. It goes on to say uh, in First John chapter 4, it says here, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. If you know God and you love God, you know what will be manifested in your life? Love. You'll love others. You'll be a forgiving person. You'll be a person who's able to allow things. Yes, things will come into your life. People will hurt you at times. Different things will happen to you. But you know something? There's a power of operating in your life and you're able to forgive. You're able to love those who haven't necessarily shown any love to you. You know, we go into the open air week by week. We're not shown not always a, not always a lot of love. Sometimes people are quite courteous and nice. But sometimes you're not shown a lot of love. But that doesn't change your feelings towards them. We still love. We still love the people who walk by and we desire that God will speak to them and touch their hearts. Otherwise, why would we be there? You know what the Apostle Paul says? See, whatever we do, if we don't love, it's pointless. It's absolutely pointless. It says that in 1 Corinthians 13, where there's tinkling symbols. We make a lot of noise, but there's no substance. There's not, nothing real in us. Remember, he says that in 1, 1 Corinthians 13. Well, we can see a lot of nice things, but if we have no love, we've got nothing. Bible says here, though I speak with tongues of men and of angels that have not charity or love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tingling cymbal. Something that's empty. These percussion instruments. Inside there's not there's just air trapped inside and it make a fancy noise. And that's some, somehow sometimes we can be like that. We can say a lot of things that really we don't love. It's love, brothers and sisters. Goes on to say, I know I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains 
and have not charity or love, I am nothing. Wow. See the importance of love. And that love can only come. That supernatural love can only come through God. Through knowing God. And through knowing, having the Lord Jesus Christ. The mystery dwelling within you. Through the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. Our lives are to be supernatural. That's why Jesus came. To give us supernatural life. We can't overcome the things of this world. We can't over Satan, the God of this world, through our natural power. But hallelujah. You know something? In the name of Jesus, Jesus says, put him under your foot. What? This mighty adversary, the devil? Yes. Yes. You've got power in the name of Jesus to overcome the God of this world, Satan, the God of this world. Principalities and powers under your feet through the Lord Jesus Christ. What? Surely that's not possible. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Word of God says. The Word of God says, yes, you have authority in the name of Jesus. I thought Andrean had a word of, a rhema word there, but it wasn't she was just sneezing. But you know what I'm saying? God has given us power, brothers and sisters, over the, the powers that oversee this world, the spiritual wickedness in high places. We see oh, it's a difficult day. Yes, it can be. If I'm not walking in the Spirit, if I'm not realizing the authority that comes through the name of Jesus Christ. And, you know, I look to these, you know, it cost God a lot to give us that and to bring us into that relationship. You know why Jesus came? Because he wanted a relationship with us. The I am came, took flesh and blood. We looked at these verses in Hebrews chapter 1. Maybe we looked at a few verses and I showed you things that you probably already know. But you know, it's not always a case of, well, I know these things. I've heard these things before. I know this. I know that. You know, brothers and sisters, you know when you know it. You know, we, we, we read scriptures and it says, John 8 and chapter 30, uh, verse 32, you know, Jesus said to his disciples, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You see, see if we're in bondage, see if we find ourselves in bondage, at that moment, the truth is not being activated and lived out in our life. Because when we know the truth, the truth makes you free. You know what that means? You're made to be free. You're not made to be in bondage. When God makes something, he doesn't make any mistakes. You know, it's like if somebody says to me, I want you to make a, I want you to make a part from a computer. You know, the hard drive isn't working or something like that. You know, know that I know anything about it. Oh, Robert, I know you're, you can make hard. No, I couldn't make a hard drive for a computer. So if I made it, it wouldn't fit. But you know what? See, when God makes something, he makes it right. He makes it fit for purpose. And if God says in his word, the truth shall make you free, then God has made you for that very purpose, to be free. It's not a, it's not a situation where, well, I'm free now, but I'm not free now. No, no, it doesn't work that way. You're either made free or you're not made free. If you're made for a purpose, you know, the word of God says he's raised us up and made us, made us, made us to sit in heavenly places. That means, if, that means if we don't live a life that's what God has made us for, then it's a contradiction to what God has made us for. I mean, if I say, well, I'm a, I'm a joiner, right? I've spent all my years learning how to be a joiner, carpenter, and I, I come into somebody's house and say, right, I'm, I'm, a, I'm here to plumb a sink in. I don't know. You're not, you're not a plumber. You're a joiner. I learned that to fulfill that part. Well, it's the same with God. When God makes us for something, it's for that very purpose. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't send, he doesn't send a joiner to fit a bathroom suite. I know God doesn't sin, but you know, what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Poor illustration. But when God makes us for something, he doesn't make mistakes. You, you've been made fit for that very purpose. That's why Jesus came. <coughs> we saw from Hebrews uh, chapter 1, 
God, who at sundry times and in divers' manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, Jesus Christ is God, is God. He was the brightness of God's glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins. I use that, 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 that idea, himself. You know, that wasn't an angel. That wasn't just like an angel in the Old Testament. The Lord sent his angel. Oh, just send the angel. No, no, it says he himself. He himself purged our sins. And I, and I went through it. He himself took flesh and blood, Hebrews 2 and 14. He himself suffered, verse 18 of chapter 2. It was God himself. You know, and I remember there was a time in Zion when somebody uh, brought up an accusation when I was preaching that I said, God died for you. God died for you. Pastor used to use that quite a lot, that God actually died for his people. And I remember a brother uh, one time had said to me, well, if God shed his blood, where, where does it say God had blood? What does it say in the Bible is God get blood? God's got blood. And I says, right away, I didn't even need to think about it. I says, Acts, Acts chapter 20 and 28. And you know, you're, you're probably familiar with these verses. Acts 20 and 28. This is Paul speaking to the elders at Ephesus. And he says to them, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God, the whole counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. There you go. There's a scripture there saying the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. And remember even at that time you know what I noticed at that time? I don't know if you noticed it. Whenever this, that person was coming in saying different things about the person of Jesus Christ, you know what I remember? You know what I was very conscious of? We were scared to sing songs like, And Can It Be? Remember? We're scared to sing songs. Well, And Can It Be That Thou My God Should Die For Me? We're scared to sing these things. Why? Because somebody brings some, something against what the word of God's declaring. And they don't like it. Oh, and they start to, they start to say all sorts of things. And then me become, oh, oh, can we sing this? Can we say this? Can we do that? Can we do the next thing? See if it's in this Bible. Don't worry what anybody thinks. Just you sing it. Just you sing it. And just you trust the Holy Spirit will bless you to sing it. Oh, can we sing that? That God died for me? But God can't die! You're right. God in his deity can't die. Any humanity he could. And at that time, at that time I showed you, yeah, I, remember, I remember even saying uh, that I'll, I'll give you a verse from Revelations chapter 1 that even God himself said he died. That's an astounding thing, isn't it? And it's Revelations chapter 1. You see, <laughs> the reason I'm saying these things, do you, ever, do you ever sit down and consider the cost, the cost that was paid for you to bring, for God to bring you into a relationship with himself? The Bible tells us what the cost was. God had to take flesh and blood and die. This is all about relationships, this Bible. A relationship with three divine persons. And this is Revelation chapter 1. And you know something? There's one thing the devil doesn't like. And you know what? You know what that is? He can't stop us from being saved. But you know what he'll try and stop us to? For entering deeper into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and with our Heavenly Father. You see, these truths are all given to us to show us the depth of the relationship that God wants with us. 
And there's one thing the powers of this world will seek to try and stop, and that's us entering and living, having a living relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and knowing God as our Father. That's something the devil hates because it brings him glory. It blesses the Father when we come to him as his sons. It blesses the Lord Jesus Christ when we come to him knowing him we are his church that he purchased. And he desires this relationship with us. Remember I says, I'll give you that verse. I, I'm not sure if you remember that verse. I sought to show you through the word of God at that time that God called himself the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega in the Old Testament. You'll get that in Isaiah 43 and Isaiah 44. He called himself the first and the last. You'll get I'll give you one verse, Isaiah 44 and uh, verse 6. And he said, to, he says, beside me there is no God. Imagine God saying that. You ever, you ever think about what God actually says here? It says in Isaiah 44, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, that's Israel's Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Omega. And beside me, there is no God. He goes on to say over in verse 8, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from, the t from that time? And I've declared that ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Think about the way, the way God comes and says to him, Do you think there's another God other than me? I don't know any gods. I don't know any other gods. You know, it's, a, it's the way God brings it. It's the way God speaks to us and shows us. It's enough to say, well, if there's any other gods, show me. Because I don't know any other gods. Because I'm the only God. And that God of the Old Testament is our God. Remember um, when uh, Ruth was coming back with Naomi and she says, Thy God will be my God. Remember? Who can say that? You know, we, 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 if we were brought up in different parts of the world, we, we would have brought up under different traditions. And we would have really had different gods, different gods of the traditions of where, you know, who can say that, who, who decides what God we're going to have? You know, I can, when I was brought up, I was, I was the God of my own destiny. But God decided that he was going to be my God. He chose me in Christ so that he could reveal to me, I'm your God, Robert. I'm your God. And you're my child. And I'm going to reveal to you who I am. Why? Why did he do that? Why did he do that for us? Divine love. Divine love brought, God, brought the Lord Jesus Christ to reveal himself to you and me. To bring us into relationship with himself. I am the resurrection and the life. And at that time I said to you, yes, I said to you, I'll show you from the scriptures that God actually says from his own mouth that he died. That's amazing, isn't it? For God to say, I died, but I'm now alive. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. It says here over in verse, I'm reason I'm saying Alpha and Omega and the first and the last because this is, this is the way he comes and he addresses, he addresses John here in Revelation chapter 1, saying in verse 11, this is when John heard the voice of a trumpet behind him and he turned to see what the voice was and the voice said, said I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest write in a book. And then over to verse uh, 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Who's the first and the last? God. Alpha and Omega. He's the first and the last. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. What? You're God and you were dead? 
Yeah, that's right. But we know. We know in what context, in what context he said these. Wasn't it in his deity? In his humanity? But you must remember, it's still the same person, albeit two natures. That's why we can look at these scriptures and say, that's God. That's God. Regardless of whether he was in his human nature or in his divine nature, he was still one person. God. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Wow. Divine love. Divine love did that for you and me. You know why? That hopefully one day the penny would drop. The cost that God paid for bringing you and me into a relationship with himself. Doesn't always, the penny doesn't always drop. You don't always realize. Sometimes we can put lots of things before the Lord in my life. We can put lots of different things before God. Why? Because the penny hasn't dropped. The penny doesn't always drop. But God comes and he's gracious and he's loving and he's forgiving. And he knows, he knows ultimately until he gets us home to glory, there'll be times when we forget him. When we forget, we forget the cost that he paid. But that's what he did. He came. And it says in, even I mentioned the last time in chapter 6 and verse 13, he even swear by himself, by two immutable things, where it should have been possible for God to lie. Imagine that. God made these two things immutable when he declared that he would, he would fulfill them. And he fulfilled them. Well, how? How did he fulfill these two immutable things in the person of Jesus Christ? When he, when he, when he promised to Abraham away back in Genesis 22. Remember, it's even, there's, even a, there's, a beautiful, there's a beautiful bit here. I know you're familiar with it. You know, I was looking at that, that whole idea of he himself, he himself will come, he himself will do all of these things. You know what it says in, in Genesis 22? And you'll know, you know the verse. You know what I'm going to say. Remember, Abraham takes Isaac. And, he, and Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb. And that's exactly what he did. Yes, what was declared here would even supersede. Yes, we know there was a goat up here stuck in the thicket, but no, God would provide himself a lamb to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant, to, to fulfill all that God was promising to Abraham, and it was all fulfilled ultimately through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it says over here in Hebrews, men I said to you, why should God... It says, by two immutable things. You always think of immutability with God, you know, with his divine person. But here God is making things immutable. You see this? Before immutable things were, 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 weren't outside God. You know what I'm trying to say? They were all encapsulated within God and his divine persons. But now he's making things immutable. <laughs> Why is he doing that? Oh, brothers and sisters, you know why? He had to. Because God wants an eternal relationship with you and me. A relationship that's unchangeable. He doesn't want his relationship with his people to change. So he makes them unchangeable through the Lord Jesus Christ. What does he do? He makes an unchangeable priesthood. You, you see it in Hebrews chapter 7. A priesthood that's now lived in the power of an endless life. It says here, for those priests, this is Hebrews chapter 7, verse 21, for those priests were made without an oath, uh, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. 
Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It would be an everlasting priesthood. Why? Because God wanted us to have an everlasting relationship with him. An immutable relationship with him. But you only, you only think about that in divine persons. You see what I'm getting at? You don't think about that with, with us, the church, and, 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 and God. No, but God says, no, no. I'm making our relationship immutable through the Lord Jesus Christ. Something that cannot change. Why? <laughs> Why, brothers and sisters? Because I love you. Because I love you. Because I love you so much, I'm going to make you immutable in this relationship through my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Unchangeable. Something that's unchangeable. And nothing can change. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 8, what can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Can anything? Can anything made? Can anything created? Can anything? No. He says nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Why? Because God's made it a relationship with him. Immutable <laughs> through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that's why Peter talks about us being partakers of the divine nature. Immutability is only to do with divine persons. But hallelujah, God's brought us into that. Not to make us gods, no. To make his eternal object of his love. Oh. See, when, see when we realize these things, see when we, see when we grip these, grasp these things, we realize that this isn't just something, you know, we can have airy-fairy thoughts about, well, I'm a Christian, I'm, you know, but you, but, when we, if we realize that God has made these things unchangeable now through the Lord Jesus. That's why Jesus had to rise from the, the grave. See, when Jesus rose, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Why? To confirm all that God had promised through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the promise to Abraham, God would confirm it all through the, the death, yes, and through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that we are what? Reconciled to God. Brought into relationship with God. Second Corinthians chapter five, you know, you're familiar with these verses. And this was the passage that I tried to show to that brother who was adamant that Jesus Christ was not God on the cross. It says here in Second Corinthians chapter five, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You see? In your flesh and blood, you are not in an immutable relationship with God. In your past life, you would never have known anything like that. and not, None of us would ever have known that. But now, all things are new. Through the Lord Jesus Christ. We're new. All things have become new. All things are passed away. All things have become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. What? Verse 19. To wit that God was in Christ. God, yes, Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But Jesus was still God. <laughs> he was still the same person. He was a divine person. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Why did he want to reconcile us back to himself? Because he says, I love you. That's why. I love you. And I want to reconcile you to myself again and bring you into this unchangeable relationship that nothing can affect. Nothing's going to change it. Nothing can affect it. Nothing's going to alter it. Hebrews chapter 8. Remember it says by his, that God by two immutable things confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. What's the two immutable things? It's in the person of Jesus Christ. 
I've often heard that his oath and his covenant, it was all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The, the everlasting priesthood. And how would that come about? How would that all come about? Through sonship. The promise of God would come through sonship. Here's here, Hebrews chapter 7. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, that they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You'll say, what is it? you know, as I look at the people of God, it's as if you're saying, well, what's that going to do with me? <laughs> well, it's got a lot to do with you. He goes on to say, but this man, because he had continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. And it goes on to say over in uh, verse 26, for such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people. For this he did once when he offered up him, Self. There he is again. He offered up his self. For the law maketh men high priests, which hath infirmity. But the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the son. It was all dependent on sonship. And you know, brothers and sisters, God's been good to us. You know that not every church in this land believes or has the truth of sonship in their church. You know that? Not everybody believes in the, the true sonship humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. He only became the son when he took flesh and blood. It's here. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You know what that tells me? You know what that tells me? See, if the doctrine of a church denies the true sonship humanity of Christ, that's not the true church. You know, the pastor once preached. Uh, he says he said he once preached at one time about churches in the area. He says, you know something? There's no true church outside a sonship, a sonship foundation of church. There's no true because you what, what are you building it on? Sonship deity. What, what you, what you, what's the church being built on? Sonship deity. Is it? Has it been built in sonship deity? No. Matthew 16. Matthew 16 tells us what the church is built on. Matthew chapter 16. You only have the true church where sonship preached. Because the true church is built on the sonship humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what that does? That ties up with heaven. The truth that's in heaven. It says here in Matthew 16, this is when Jesus said to the, those, the disciples, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Here's this idea of I am again. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, I'm going to be finishing in a few moments. He asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, look at this, there's a play on the words here, I, the son of man, am. See what he does? He splits up the I am with the Son of Man in the middle. See that? What, what, what's that telling you? His true sonship was veiled. The true sonship humanity of Jesus Christ is veiled. Do you know that? You see, don't get me wrong. You can say, you can say, well, I've been brought up in Zion and I've I know what the Bible says about sonship, right? But you don't get sonship. You can see I've got the doctrine of sonship. That's no sonship. Until you get a revelation of sonship. That's sonship. That's what Peter got. And where does that revelation come from? The Father. Remember when Peter get the, Paul get the revelation of sonship, maybe what he said, I conferred not with flesh and blood. Just doctrine itself can never convey to you the truth of sonship. 
You have to get a revelation of it. Peter says, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that they are John the Baptist, and some say Elias, and some... And you know something, you meet people in the open air, Muslims, different people say, Oh, I believe in Jesus. Oh, I, believe in, I believe he was a prophet, I believe he was this, I believe he was that. But you not believe he's the Son of God? No. He goes on to say, But whom say ye that I am? Notice what he does. He takes the Son of Man out and then he puts the I am together. <laughs> You'll see there's a play on the words here. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not, not revealed it unto you, but my Father in heaven. I'll never get a revelation of sonship, and neither will you, unless the Father gives you the revelation of sonship. You know that? You can read this Bible to your 200, 100 year old, and you know something? Unless the Father gives you a revelation of sonship, you'll never really know it. That's why when Paul got it, he says, I conferred not with flesh and blood. I cannot speak to people who have not had this same revelation. Because it's not flesh, not conveyed through flesh and blood. It's conveyed through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he goes on to say, but my Father in heaven has revealed this unto you. And he goes on to say, and I say unto you, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prove. What rock are you going to build your church? On the revelation of what? Sonship. The revelation of sonship is going to build his church. That's why I'm saying, if the, if the church is not built on the truth of sonship humanity, it's not the true church. That's where our pastor labored for years and years and years. And that must come from the Father. That only the Father can reveal true sonship to you. The Father's here. The Father's dwelling inside you. They should all be taught of God, the Scripture says. Tell me something. Have you, has the Father taught you sonship? Do you just know the doctrine of sonship? Or do you actually know you're a son? I'll leave you with that. I'm, I'm running out of time. I'm not... I'll leave you with that. Flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you. Remember Paul says, the gospel I received, I didn't receive it by man. See, I told you, it's supernatural. It's not natural. It's not flesh and blood. It's got to be power, the power of God. May God bless these thoughts to you. Um,